I think I have to change account. Uh, hope it I can still come back. Hey Adriana, how are you? <laughs> Sorry, I was in mute. Hi. Hi, nice to see you. Nice seeing you too. Yeah, good morning, Adriana. Hi. Premi enjoyed her virtual visit to Tennessee the other week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You liked it? <laughs> no. so, but she said it was very hard work. Um, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, well, because they gave her a really full schedule. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Andrena, good to see you. Hi, how are you? <laughs> good to see you. Hey, Piers, good to see you. Hey, nice to see you, Peng Cheng. Cheng, hi. Hey, yeah. Hey, 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 Rick, yeah. Yeah, it's hard to tell who's speaking on Zoom sometimes. Yeah. That's why it's always good to have it in the uh, gallery mode. Yeah. Because then you can see everyone light up as they're talking. Oh. At, at, at the beginning of the pandemic, somebody said that the Zoom meetings are like you're talking to a black hole and any face that you see is like Hawking radiation. <laughs> <laughs> Hawking radiation, okay. <laughs> Actually, there is a mode in which um, you can put the face of the person that is speaking. So that you get that in a big uh, screen. And, yeah, that's right. You know. <laughs> yet, yet another illusion. <laughs> no, the gallery mode is good. I never realized that. The gallery mode is useful. Yeah, I didn't realize it. But you really need uh, several screens. And so you look like you're in some kind of security service looking at multiple screens. <laughs> talks. So, um, maybe Joe how maybe we should. Okay, sure. So welcome everyone. Uh, this is the last section of the this iron based superconductor seminar series. So today we'll have two exciting talks, uh, one from Pierce Coleman and the other is from Andrea Murillo. So we'll begin with Pierce talk and then it uh, looks like Pierce already is sharing the screen and um, so please go ahead, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure. Um, I only wish I was there in person down in Texas. Um, so today I'm gonna to tell you about uh, work we've been doing, uh, mainly in conjunction with Yasha Komajani at University of Cincinnati and Elio Koenig, who is now uh, uh, at the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart. And we've been exploring the concept of the Hunts metal and asking, uh, can Hund's coupling play a role in iron-based superconductivity, okay? And so the proposal that I want to introduce you to today is the concept of triplet RVB, TRVB. And uh, we're gonna ask, can we extend Anderson's RVB picture and pairing to include systems with ferromagnetic and Hund's interactions? This is uh, my over ambitious list of topics that I try and get done in 25 minutes. We'll see, it may be a bit of a joke, but interrupt me as much as you like and we'll see how far we get. Um, so uh, great. Um, so let's move on and just remind ourselves about Anderson's RVB concept. 30 odd years ago, Anderson proposed the intriguing idea that the resonating valence bonds of a spin liquid can on doping provide the pairing for the development of unconventional superconductivity. And here's a picture of Phil at the Woodstock of Physics. And uh, we have it, we can see that he was sitting right next to Georg Bednors. Okay, and his idea, which is well known, but just to remind it, it what well, here's the phase diagram as it was known in 1987. Uh, and he proposed that the Mott insulator was a spin liquid of resonating valence bonds, a pre-entangled fluid of singlet spin pairs, which when on doping uh, would then become a D-wave super, well, now we know, but would become a D-wave superconductor. And of course, we now know that the Mott insulator in the real system is an antiferromagnet. Nevertheless, we still believe that uh, aspects of this picture are correct and that the mother state of the D-wave pairing can be regarded as a kind of RVB spin liquid. And so this is interesting because it's an entanglement driven pairing mechanism. 
The idea is that the preformed pairs formed by the magnetism on doping provide the pairing between the spins that drives the formation of a Cooper condensate on doping. Okay, so this raises the interesting question, can you extend this idea to include systems with ferromagnetic Kuntz interactions? And, the, and as you'll see, in fact, Anderson actually thought about this in 1985, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. So the key idea is, can we use uh, ferromagnetic coupling to drive entanglement-driven pairing? And there's a lot of motivation for this. Let me show you uh, one example that fascinates us. This is uranium ditelluride. It's a 1.5 Kelvin superconductor, in which triplet pairing, we believe, survives beyond 50 Tesla. And there's a lot of indications that the on-site forces are very important in this system. Uh, and here's another one that fascinates us. This is uh, a system we call Sergei, cerium, rhodium, germanium. And it, it's a ferromagnet, which when you squeeze it under pressure, forms a strange metal at a quantum critical point. And uh, we got interested in this whole idea because we realized we could understand this physics by proposing that this system uh, develops a kind of uh, triplet RVB state due to the anisotropic uh, ferromagnetic coupling. So in an, in an uh, oh, and last but not least to our seminar today, what about the ion based superconductors? Well, one of the things that caught our eye was this uh, very nice uh, compilation of GAP uh, versus TC uh, by uh, Chubukov, Kotliar, Ding, Hongding, Miao, and others, in which they noticed this interesting um, constancy of ratio between the maximum GAP and TC over this wide range of calcogenide and uh, and pernictide ion based superconductors. And this is interesting uh, because this ratio holds uh, with a diversity of different Fermi surface morphologies from electron pockets to hole pockets. And it seems to suggest that uh, the independence of two delta over KTC on Fermi surface morphology suggests perhaps a local origin to the pairing. That's certainly what these authors wrote. And so this provided further stimulus for our thoughts on what we now call the triplet RVB proposal. So let me try and explain this concept to you. What is the triplet RVB concept? Let me first remind you, what, remind you about what happened. So, so the key idea is to get entanglement out of a spin interaction. And at first sight, this seems like a misnomer because whilst we know that anti-ferromagnetic interactions give an entangled singlet ground state. If we have a ferromagnetic coupling, well, it just gives us a, a spin one ground state, which is a product state. There's no entanglement there. So if the spins point sideways, it looks like this, and we can expand the state uh, in the up-down basis in the following way. Uh, this it looks rather complicated, but it is nevertheless a, an entangled state. Nevertheless, if we now put some anisotropy into this system that eliminates the parallel spin configurations, okay, such as uh, an XY anisotropy, then we see we get a ferromagnetically entangled state. Okay, and this is the entangled state. So putting in anisotropy induces entanglement into uh, ferromagnetically coupled systems. And of course, what this does is split off from the spin one manifold of triplet states, a singlet state, but it's a triplet singlet, a, a singlet which is, has triplet correlations in it. Okay, so uh, this is interesting and we can take it one step further by noticing an interesting uh, connection between valence bonds, singlet valence bonds, RVBs, and triplet valence bonds. Here is a singlet valence bond, and it's the ground state of uh, uh, an antiferromagnetic interaction. But if we now carry out a spin rotation on the even sites, it's a unitary transformation, this converts an RVB to a TRVB, and it also transforms the Hamiltonian to uh, uh, an easy plane XY ferromagnet. And so that's what we have here. OK, so having done that, this teaches us an interesting lesson. OK, in particular, one of the things we know is that short range RVB, even in three dimensions, such as is a nice example, is actually equivalent to a kind of hidden antiferromagnetism. If you take a short range RVB system and you look at its uh, spin correlations, it turns out it actually has hidden long range antiferromagnetic order. So if we take this model, on a bipartite lattice, and then we now rotate the spins through 180 degrees at every other side. Uh, 
we then get a system which is a triplet RBB ground state. And this describes hidden XY ferromagnetism. So the message here is that uh, we can construct TRBB states macroscopically. We can learn about them and that we can convert an RVB state to a TRVB state by carrying out a 180 degree spin rotation on one of the sites or on the even sites. So let's look at what that does to Anderson's RVB picture. So here is the decoupling of the spin interaction in terms of singlet pairs. If we now rotate the spins on one site through 180 degrees, we now have this anisotropic ferromagnetic interaction, which we can now decouple in terms of triplet pairs. There we go. And so we can now take such an interaction and imagine doping it. And uh, there is a story which I won't get into today about one band systems. And you can play exactly the same game that was played in the early days of RVB on a TJ model with an anisotropic uh, ferromagnetic coupling. And you can show that this leads on doping to a P wave, or in fact, a fully gap PX plus I PY state and the simplest system. Okay. But that's not the topic of our talk today. We we're going to talk about Hunt's metals. So let's now talk about how this might work in uh, Hunt systems. And it's there here that the connection with Phil's old ideas, we lost Phil last year, but we're still mulling through some of his great ideas. And one of the great ideas he had back in 1985, in the days of early heavy electron superconductivity, was to use the Hunt's coupling as a driver for triplet pairing. And Anderson originally, immediately saw there was a problem because when you have an atom with a center of symmetry at the atom, even if you have triplet pairs forming inside that atom, they basically have even parity character. And you can see that because when you apply the parity operator to individual orbitals, what you get here is the product of their parities, which is plus. And so this is a, an even parity paired state. And the Cooper pairs on the Fermi surface um, have P equals minus one, they're odd parity. And so atomic triplet pairs cannot migrate to the Fermi surface as long as a parity is a good quantum number, which is what we want to do. We don't want to do inversion uh, systems that don't have inversion symmetry. However, if you move the center of inversion away from an atom and consider, for example, two atoms with a shared center of symmetry, now uh, you can contemplate two kinds of pairing state, one with an it's even under inversion and one that's odd with a staggered gap symmetry. And this interesting state has P equals minus one. It doesn't break translation symmetry because you've got two atoms or an even number of atoms per unit cell, okay? And a staggered gap with P equals minus one will mix with triplet pairs on the Fermi surface, allowing the escape of atomic triplets, driving a Cooper instability. And that was the essence of this paper here, which has only really been picked up by a small minority of people. It only has 14 citations today, and three of them are from our own papers. Um, uh, uh, these were early uh, authors who realized the interest in this paper, particularly an interesting paper by Mike Norman in 1994, which really wasn't pursued further except by Hotter and Ueda. We're now gonna pursue that further in part noticing that many interesting superconductors, such as ion-based superconductors, uranium ditelluride, and perhaps twisted double bilayer graphene fall into this category as potential triplet candidates. Okay, so let's look at that in more detail in the context of an iron tetrahedron. Iron tetrahedron, uh, the electrons live in the T2G states, the XY, XZ, and ZX orbitals. And uh, we're gonna think about the orbitals as sites, okay? And so this indicates a triplet, uh, a triplet state formed between an XY and a YZ orbital. And if we're doing it with electrons, it's obviously odd parities anti-symmetric between the orbitals, hence the coloring. And so now um, if we take that state, uh, we can stabilize it by putting in a tetrahedral anisotropy and if you add in all possible cyclic permutations, uh, you've still got the tetrahedral symmetry, but it now stabilizes some interesting states. Let's look at what actually happens here. Okay, We can create a, a, a local pair by combining spin and orbital degrees of freedom. Okay, And this operator here is the is the angular momentum operator. It's minus I epsilon ABC. And so this is one of nine possible pairs you can create on site with L equals one and S equals one. Okay. 
And so now we can think of the interaction as looking basically like this, with this anisotropic interaction going on here. And uh, so now let's look at what that does. So if we put in some spin orbit coupling, our manifold is split into states of n equals uh, j equals two, one, and zero. And the Hund's coupling, of course, stabil stabilizes the high spin configurations. Okay. If we now put in the anisotropy, what happens is that this splits up. It's a crystal field effect, if you like. And so in the strong coupling limit of an isolated tetrahedron, we can expect these interesting TRVB states to be stabilized. And in terms of this variable uh, 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 lambda, which, uh, uh, which de de determines the combination of pairs, uh, the states of particular interest, the ones where this is diagonal with a one, one, minus two, think of this as a crystal field state with L equals L equals one, S equals one, and J equals two, split by the crystal field environment, okay? So what happens if these pairs manage to escape into their environment, okay? And so that's the, the question we, we tried to ask. And so we're gonna take two iron tetrahedra and bring them close together. And we're gonna ask what will now happen. And it's here that the non-symorphic aspect of the physics becomes very important because the hopping between the sites, particularly the hopping between the XY and the YZ orbitals, has an interesting property uh, that uh, this hopping T7 has an opposite sign for hopping to the left and hopping to the right. So let's look at what happens if we take such a triplet valence bond, apply the T7 hopping, it now brings the valence bond state between two sites okay, two YZ orbitals, and then it rotates it round again. And you'll notice that as a result of this rolling operation, the, the uh, pair on site one has changed its sign onto site two. So that were this to become coherent, the gap would actually have opposite signs on the two ion atoms, okay? Um, and in fact, uh, uh, the, these hoppings look like this in a simple model of the ion based superconductors. And so this kind of model would predict a staggered pairing exactly as Anderson envisaged. Um, and so we can then put together the idea of taking these individual triplet valence bonds and now exponentiating it to form a triplet RVB state, bringing in a Gutzwiller projection that prevents no more than one electron per uh, T2G orbital, okay? So that's the proposed wave function. And what we're gonna talk about now is what happens when we treat the Gutzwiller constraint here with a mean field theory, which means we basically uh, factorize these localized Hund's interactions in this particular form, okay? So let's now look at that and see what it leads to, a mean field theory of the TRVB pairing state, okay? So that's, that's what we started with. And now let's write down the Hamiltonian, okay? It contains a kinetic part and an interaction part. This kinetic part, what we're gonna do is take the Daghofer uh, uh, three-band Hamiltonian. It's not perfect uh, because of some of the topological obstructions present in the ion based superconductors. But most importantly, it has these uh, terms here that mix the XY uh, and the XZ or the XY and the YZ orbitals. These are the tumbling, the T7 components that I referred you to earlier, okay? And so this is the kind of Fermi surface we get from such a model with electron and hole pockets, hole pockets and electron pockets, I guess. Um, and the important thing now is to ask, well, what will this pairing do? First, in the absence of spin orbit coupling. Uh, and of course, we now need to talk about the D vector. So the D vector is the, determines the gap structure when we project it onto, into the band basis. And uh, so what that happens in this model, it turns out if you project this kind of interaction into the band basis, then you discover that the D vector <clears throat> actually has this interesting form in which these are the eigenvalues of the Daghofer uh, Hamiltonian. And what's interesting is that since the system is non-symorphic, UNK is complex due to these tumbling modes. And so there would be triplet pairing on the Fermi surface. If it, weren't, if it were symorphic, you would be real and this cross product would vanish. So this is Anderson's effect working on this model, okay? So now let's look at what this predicts for the D vector. This is kind of the structure of the D vector. It's got a rather interesting uh, uh, texture. Thing to notice is it doesn't point in any one direction and it actually has sign reversals. Um, 
if you now look at the gap function of this, without, without spin-orbit coupling, in fact, the gap is actually vanishes at certain points. But the moment we turn on spin-orbit coupling, we find the gap, it becomes a fully gapped superconductor. Um, and this is rather interesting because, as you know, in these systems, if you correlate the uh, spin orbit splitting uh, 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 with the um, uh, size of the gap, there is a nice correlation that's going on there. So that's rather interesting. And uh, uh, let me look, show you a bit more. This is what the gap looks like on the various electron and hole pockets. So it's a good, respectable gap. Um, and so the question is, well, that's an interesting uh, little model you've got there, but is there any hope that you could test these ideas with experiment? And what about experiments that have already been done? So let's uh, end up by looking at the phenomeno phenomenology of TRVB. Uh, and uh, so let's look at that. So just to summarize, this superconducting order parameter in the orbital basis in real state space actually has this staggered quality that I've shown here, okay, to satisfy Anderson's theorem. Uh, but it also has an interesting structure of its d vectors in real space. Um, and without spin orbit coupling, it looks like this, of course, with spin orbit coupling, you convert spin into orbital degrees of freedom. And so you have singlet components mixing in, okay. And so one of the things that has ruled out P-way pairing in this field up to the moment has been the night shift. And here you can see the night shift, for example, uh, for uh, calcogenide and anictide. And one of the things you notice is that there is a night shift there uh, and it's anisotropic in the different directions. And traditionally, uh, the observation of this night shift in all directions was used as the killer blow to any triplet pairing. And so, for example, Wen and Lee abandoned their model of P-way pairing in the early days of ion-based superconductivity based on this kind of evidence, okay? However, when you bring in the effect of spin-orbit coupling to a triplet RBB uh, model, you see that actually the susceptibility does exhibit a night shift. And that's partly because the D vector points in all directions, um, and uh, it also exhibits anisotropy. Okay, we're using a very non-realistic model here. Um, uh, and so of course the details would depend on many other aspects. But it does illustrate the point that the criticism that a night shift rules out triplet pairing no longer applies. Okay, and this opens up us to considering the possibility that Hunt's coupling could be a driver for ion-based superconductivity. Um, Quasiparticle interference is another important indicator of uh, the underlying pairing, and this has been used also as an indication of sign changing gaps and uh, D-wave or, or S plus minus pairing, okay? Uh, however, in fact, this only depends on the fact you've got a sign changing order parameter on your Fermi surface. And in a triplet system, all this requires is that the D vector uh, at different points on the Fermi surface changes sign. And that's really what we have in our little model of TRVB. What replaces this term here is the dot product of the D vectors on the Fermi surface. And so this hurdle can also be dealt with, okay? So, okay, so very good, but what about other aspects of the theory? Well, in particular, what about the staggered pairing that is predicted by Anderson's theorem here? How could we detect that? So. Um, one of the ways to detect it in principle is to have a real state space probe or pairing. And this would apply to any Hunt's driven superconductor such as uranium ditelluride. You'd need to be able to probe the local gap sign, okay? And you can't do that with conventional tunneling, okay? But you could do it if you could do Josen tunneling using an STM tip, okay? This would be the Hamiltonian for such Josen tunneling. Here is the coupling between the local phases. And here is the Coulomb term. And one of the really important things about this uh, uh, is that you've got to minimize the Coulomb coupling. The other thing is that you'd want to maximize the coupling between the tip and the material. So one of the best ways of doing that would be to have an ion-based uh, superconducting tip in such an experiment. However, the experiment would probably still likely not work uh, although in principle it would look like this, unless you've got your Coulomb, your, your charging energy under control. And uh, uh, so here's our proposal for how you could actually do this. You'd have a fixed tip and you have a mobile tip 
And to minimize the charging energy, you'd maximize the capacitance using a shunt capacitor. Um, so this requires for Josen tunneling, the E squared over C tip is smaller than the Josen coupling. And this is never realized in current STM work. However, to avoid this, ST, this dilemma, we'd add in a shunt uh, capacitance. This would then switch on the Josen tunneling and would provide an interesting tool if it worked for local probes of uh, superconductivity uh, in a variety of systems. For example, if you were interested in a pair density wave, you might want to be able to probe things this way. But for TRVB, it would be the acid test of the theory, you'd expect to see a staggered superconducting phase as you scanned your Josen tip over the thing. And so the critical current would actually alternate as a function of position. Okay, and uh, so uh, here is a little calculation using a little model of what you might expect. Okay, um, so I'm done. My conclusions are the concept of RVB can be extended to uh, triplet spin pairs in anisotropic ferromagnetic systems. And in some sense, the on-site triplet RVB is really what we've known in heavy electron systems uh, as a Hund's coupled atom. Those singlets that you see in a non-Kramer's atom can be thought of as resonating RVBs, triplet RVBs, resonating between the sites, between the orbitals inside the atom, okay? And so if you've got a system with two atoms per unit cell, then you can have a TRVB state. And in the case of our model for ion-based superconductors, it predicts a fully gap pair state driven by Hund's coupling. Um, and the isotropy of the night shift and the sign change in the D vector are in loose accord with uh, STM measurements and uh, night shift measurements. The gap alternation is the acid test of this idea, and it's expected to be a consistent property of Hund's coupled triplet superconductivity with the center of inversion that lies between the Hund's coupled atoms. Iron-based superconductors, uranium ditelluride, uh, twisted bilayer graphene, and other systems uh, may be candidates for this kind of pairing, and we hope that it will be possible in the future for experimentalists to uh, uh, generate, to, to to create scanning Josen microscopes, which might be able to detect uh, this staggered pairing that originally uh, goes back to Anderson's proposal of 1985. Thank you very much. Thank you, Piers, for this very interesting talk. So uh, any question for Piers? Okay, so I see a question from uh, Adriana. Yeah, uh, Piers, Adriana. really interesting talk. Um, I have a question about um, how do you envision the normal state for that, uh, for your for your TRVB state? So you raise the temperature and above the, the superconductivity, what, is the, what does the state look like? Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. And our primitive little theory cannot answer that question, okay, because it's a dumb little BCS theory at its current stage. So what you need to do is to go beyond this kind of theory and, and take into account the Hund's coupling and the valence fluctuations on the local side. And uh, uh, one of the interesting things we know is that there is this interesting regime where the, spit, the electrons are trying to line up uh, in a parallel configuration, but they don't quite make it. And this regime seems to be some kind of interesting non-Fermi liquid phase. It's been seen in uh, it's been seen in uh, uh, um, uh, 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 simulations of individual atoms, and we see it in our most recently in our work done on Schwinger bosons. And so we think that the state will not be a well-formed Fermi liquid because to put form a well-formed Fermi liquid, the spins have to lock nicely together and then undergo a, a condo effect, which they don't get to do until quite low temperatures. And so the presence of only a partially screened local moments that have not formed a fully locked together Hunt's local moment will be an important part of the physics. And we think it would be an important part as, of the normal state. That's a, a very long uh, answer to say that I don't know what it will be, but I know some of the elements that are important. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Chimio is next. 
Um, yeah, Piers, um, thanks for uh, sort of stimulating the thoughts uh, uh, on uh, some of the things which I think is running for uh, from the beginning of the field. But uh, one question I, I wonder whether you've thought about is that uh, in the nictides, um, in addition to uh, CPU connecting properties that you mentioned, night shift, um, there's also some microscopic information such as uh, uh, where the CPU connecting condensation energy uh, comes from. And there is a, a magnetic spectral measurement, spin, uh, neutron scattering measurement, which shows that uh, in some sense, the usual story that the, the um, exchange energy uh, near the uh, pi zero wave vector is substantially reduced uh, when superconductivity happens. And I wonder whether that fits into the scheme that you well, I, I think that's a really important point. And of course, um, uh, I haven't discussed magnetism at all here, right? And um, so uh, presumably there's a competition between magnetism and superconductivity in this system. Um, and uh, of course, it, it's a nonsense not to include the intersite interactions in a complete, in a complete theory. So I would say that presumably what's happening is that the, uh, after all, you do have, you will still have these uh, entangled states locally, but how they couple together, how they minimize the energy is probably a competition between antiferromagnetism and the superconducting paired state. And so I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, so I would say that the fact that you see condensation energy coming out of the magnetic uh, ground state doesn't necessarily tell you that you've got a singlet superconductor. But beyond that, uh, we, we, we haven't really taken it to the next level. We, we realize that the, the kind of treatment that we've been doing here is insufficient to develop a full theory. And so we've been working very hard to uh, develop a, a kind of Schrunner boson approach for the physics to try and include the magnetic aspects. And I think, uh, I think it would be absolutely crucial to have a model that's able to incorporate this competition between the magnetism and the superconductivity. But I take your point, and a naive response to that would be to say, well, antiferromagnetism is singlets, correlations. So if there's a competition there, then, and we see that the energy is coming from the magnetism, doesn't that suggest that we've got some singlet part of the pairing? And it's probably true. And even in our theory, to have, uh, spin orbit coupling play a major role in the physics uh, means that uh, we must have some admixture there, which would which would interact with the magnetism. No, so, I, mean, I think it's very interesting to, to think along these lines. I like the the P wave state that is fully gapped. Uh, what what I sort of want to underscore is that the magnetic spectrum it actually it's a very large energy scale. It's like you know two hundred MeV spread mm -hmm. in the uh, anti fellow magnetic uh, right. of, of the mag so so it might be worth sort of to think about the competition of, of these things Absolutely. roughly the same energy scale yeah thank you Piers. thank you you're welcome yeah okay. Gustavo uh, is next yeah <clears throat> hi thanks hi Gustavo thanks for the talk very good um, I have a very simple question did you mean to say that the anisotropy <clears throat> in your X, X, Z, ham, X, Y, Z sort of Heisenberg type Hamiltonian was coming from spin orbit coupling? Well, I was, <laughs> yeah, I think it would have to in practice, right? Because without spin orbit coupling, uh, electrons that, that uh, uh, okay, is, does not conserve, once you change the sign of the Z, Z term, does not conserve a square. So it uh, has to be something. Ab absolutely. And of course, Having, we use that as a crutch in our development of our ideas, but in practice, what we did was just to use a very simplified um, tri local triplet pairing interaction. Um, so where would it come from? It would come from the interplay of spin orbit coupling and Hund's interactions in, in the ion atom. Um, and uh, in our naive attempts to estimate it, it came out much smaller than we would have liked it to have been. Um, so we did try to estimate that term from the spin orbit coupling. Yeah, I, I guess my, my, my question is, my comment is, so if, if that, that X, X, Z Hamiltonian with coefficients one, one, minus one is integrable by Richardson Godin, and it's known that a delta minus one, when the anisotropy is minus one, 
the wave function is of projected BCS type on the spin channel. Uh, are you aware of this? No, I don't know this work actually. Um, okay. So uh, I'd, I'd appreciate a reference. Who, who are the authors again? Well, it's 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 called Richardson. It's a family of Hamiltonians called yes. Richardson Godin. They are all integrable. I see. Okay. And, right. and mm. the particular one you wrote with coefficients of one, one, minus one for x, x, y, y, z, z, yes. it's actually integrable. When I delta, see. when the anisotropy is minus one, the wave function is superconducting. Okay. You, don't, you don't need the, it, it's an AGP, it's a projected BCS type on the triplet channel, I see. Uh, spin channel. And you don't actually need the Gatzwiller projector, just the mean field should be superconducting. I, I, if you could send me a reference, I really appreciate it. Good. Sure, I'll, I'll send you a reference. Yeah, thank you. You're yeah. welcome. Yeah. Okay, Igor is next. Yeah, uh, hi, uh, Pierce, uh, thanks. Uh, it's uh, such a stimulating talk. I ha have uh, almost as many questions as you had ideas in here. Uh, I'll try to limit myself. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, for it is a follow up on, on, on Tirano's question. So would it be possible in this type of a theory upon including the uh, you know magnetic interactions uh, to somehow relate the uh, pushing of the magnetic spectral weight uh, upwards uh, when the system becomes uh, um, superconducting with the uh, superconducting gap value. Once again, so when yeah, no, system I, becomes I, 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 I think when you're, you're saying, could one do that, first of all, without a detailed theory, just by using some kind of sum rules? Is that what you're saying? No, 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 that's not the question. No, what I'm saying is that I sort of know that at least in the 1-1 family of superconductors, what's happening with the low energy magnetic fluctuations is just that the spectral weight is not lost, not gained. It actually pushed up uh, above some small gap value of like five millivolts. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the, 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 the low energy part of the magnetic fluctuation spectrum is sort of wiped out uh, in mm -hmm. favor of basic, basically just being pushed up. Actually, a similar thing happens in cube rates as well. Presumably, presumably what you're saying is that if you had a little model, say an RPA type model for the magnetic fluctuations, and you right. now replaced your electrons propagators by a gapped electron, you could understand that. Yeah, you could, right? And yes, so you, uh, but it, but it, of course the question would be whether it's whether the antiferromagnetism is hurting you or helping you. I suppose would be. Um, uh, uh, I mean, you could just plug it in, but then you'd also have to. There would be a competition between having formed that gap and the magnetism that you've depleted. I suppose. Um, right, but experimentally that could be. I'm I'm just I was just saying that experimentally that could be somehow compared with theory. If okay, you have a, a, good point. That would be any, between... any gap theory. I presume it's been done with S plus minus type theories. Yeah, it has. Yes. I mean, yeah, this is, I mean, this is well known, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. But, but it suggests singular, though, that I mean, has no relevance to the, to the triplet. So I, I don't understand what, what is, what are you saying, Pinchim? Yeah, no, I'm basically saying that, I mean, the spectral wave shift, I mean, from low energy to higher energy part, I mean, that's understood the RPA, right? Based on RPA theory, well, basically the uh, exciton, you know, sort of type of model. But, but, it, but that's it, connected with a singlet, right? Not not a triplet. No, no, no. I think I think that would work with any model that's fully gapped. Right. Yeah. Right. yeah. And so if, if this model has particular predictions for that, that would be uh, one thing to check. But uh, the other question I had is uh, uh, this nice picture with uh, red and blue zigzags. Uh, uh, so it is sort of reminiscent of a competing instability that. Um, happens in the 1-1 one, one iron telluride uh, family, which is not yet superconducting, but which forms this type of orbital ordering. Is there any relation with this model? I don't know, is the answer to that question. Um, we haven't thought about orbital ordering, but, but clearly orbital ordering, magnetism are, since you've got orbital degrees of freedom and spin degrees of freedom that want to be, sat want to be satisfied, are always going to be competitors with a with a ground state that is used in entangling the spins to form a condensate. So um, uh, the orbital aspects of the physics we all know are really important in the ion based superconductors. So it's got to be part of the story. But that's again, not answering your question, I'm afraid. Sorry. Oh, okay. 
So uh, let me just uh, the final small question is the the, the part of the story about the non symmetry symmetry between the two uh, um, uh, atoms in the unit cell is does it relate in any way to Igor Mazin's recent uh, theory of anti Kramers anti Fermagnet? <laughs> I don't know because I don't know. Uh, I'll have to read. I've got a lot of reading to do at Kearney. Okay. Um, uh, I, I'll I'll have a look at that. That sounds fascinating. Um, yeah. yeah. Another question from Zhujin. Uh, hi, Piers. This is TC. Hi, uh, thanks for the nice talk. I just have a very naive question. So, <clears throat> in the in Anderson's proposal, uh, the spin sync graph formation uh, REB can turns into uh, superconductivity by condensation of the holons. Uh, I'm just wondering, do we have a similar effect in in the triplet case? I yes, we do. Um, uh, although. We, we are still struggling to put together a, a kind of slave boson description of the model that we're fully satisfied with. Um, I, think, I, I think it's exactly the same idea because the point is that the, we, we, inter, we, we interpret the, uh, the TRVB state already as a preformed pair state. So the bond variables between the orbitals provide the pairing and then the moment you turn on the valence fluctuations, you condense the bosons, you then get a superconductor. So at that level, it's exactly analogous. I see. So I assume if the slave particle description can still apply here, then we can integrate out the fermions to obtain perhaps a nonlinear sigma model describing different orders. Just, uh, yeah. Because I, I know that's happened for the singlet case, I'm not sure. Actually, I'm not even familiar with the work on the singlet case for the nonlinear signal model that's going on there. Um, uh, in fact, part of our problem is that we are still struggling as a community to understand the underlying normal state of recuperates and how that connects up to the superconductor, which we know is a D-wave superconductor, of course. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I guess I'm... I'm not familiar with the with the uh, sigma model methods that you're referring to, um, so I can't answer your question. I'd, I'd like a reference, actually, if you could send me, I'd be very interested. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I'm actually a great fan of your book. <laughs> okay. It, thank it's, you. It's, it's a pity I cannot see you in person and ask for your signature. <laughs> I have a dedicated website for paid. For, for, never mind. Anyway. Yeah. We'll good. Re uh, we'll remedy that, Piers. You just have to visit. Yeah, it does have to come down. <laughs> okay, good, thank you. Uh, can I actually ask a, a quick experimental question? Yes. So it sounds like the spin orbit coupling uh, plays a very important role uh, in yes. your model. So yes. now, since now we have so many families of iron-based superconductor with various degrees of spin orbit coupling, I mean, what a very systematic study of, um, you know, of these, you know, for example, like my shift um, um, as a function of a uh, strand of spin orbit coupling. Uh, great, yeah. I mean, that would be very interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, in our naive theory, the, the system becomes gapless in the limit that the spin orbit coupling disappears. Um, uh, because it, underneath it is a kind of triplet state, is, would be the point. Um, so, uh, so you're doing those measurements at the moment, you're saying? Uh, not yet, but uh, I mean, if that could actually help to distinguish. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I think it, the role of spin orbit coupling has been completely understated in these systems. It's big, it's considerably bigger than TC. Uh, it's two or three times bigger than TC, so or, or or more, in fact. So it must play a major role. What what precisely that is, we're not quite sure. Yeah. Great. Yeah, it's very interesting. Okay, if no more questions, and let's uh, thank Piers again, and then um Piers, if you can. I'll yeah, share your let, screen. Let me just uh, get my act together. Yeah, that's the one. And so stop the share. There we are. Uh, so the next talk will be given by Adriana. And uh, Adriana, you can share your screen now. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> um, OK, so can you see it? Yes, we can see your screen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So should I start? Yes. Yeah, we can see your screen and then we can hear you well. Yeah, great. Please go ahead. Okay. Very good. 
Okay, so um, I want to uh, thank um, um, Jim Yao and Pen Cheng and all the organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, talk to you today. Um, I will be talking about uh, orbital selective correlations and block magnetism in low dimensional iron based superconductors. And this is work that uh, I done with uh, several people. Let me just get the pointer. So, in particular, Jason like Herbrich, uh, who was a postdoc with us, as in, is now a professor at the Wroclaw University in Poland. Nitin Kaushal, Nirab Patel, Maria Dachhofer, Albert, Alberto Nochera, Gonzalo Alvarez, and Elvio Dagot. So um, all of you are very familiar with the uh, iron-based superconductor. So very quickly, just uh, to set the stage, um, you know that uh, these are compounds with uh, planes, uh, iron and nickel planes. Um, the phase diagram is kind of reminiscent of the cuprates as well as the layer structure, but with some differences. So uh, the parent compound is, um, is an antiferromagnet, but uh, not of the checkerboard kind, but of the pi zero kind, and it's not a mot insulator, but a bad metal. Uh, upon doping, the material develops superconductivity, again, reminiscent of the cuprates, but the Fermi surface is uh, very different. So it's a much more complex Fermi surface with different bands contributing to hole pockets at the center of the brilliant zone, electron pockets uh, at the boundaries. Uh, the, in the cuprates, there is mostly one orbital, one of the d orbitals that contribute to the band, while um, in the nicktais, the five d orbitals are important, and in particular, the T2G orbitals. Um, so this is in very important, a very important difference. Um, since there is pi zero nesting between hole and electron pockets in the nicktice, early on people thought that uh, the nicktice could be just a weak coupling uh, problem, okay? So the nesting would lead to this uh, uh, magnetic order and that would be it. But almost from the beginning, and actually uh, Chimiao and other people at RISE uh, started from this point of view, uh, the strong coupling point of view also led to the similar to, to, to this magnetic pattern based on the fact that uh, the, uh, in order to hop the electron from iron to iron, they had to go through the, through the nictite. So uh, the overlaps are basically equivalent going from nearest neighbors to across the diagonal, and that leads to a J1, J2 model that also has this uh, kind of ground state. Um, and eventually, um, through um, additional experiments, um, it is uh, believed now that uh, the coupling is just in between, okay? Some intermediate coupling. Uh, it's clear that it's not weak coupling because this order is observed in materials that do not have, for example, the whole pockets, so there is no nesting, and also because there are uh, large mass renormalizations uh, that are observed uh, um, experimentally. Um, so uh, it is very important uh, to consider intermediate values of the interactions. In addition to the nicktice, you know that there are the calcogenized families, okay? So uh, based on this situation, the simplest model to study the nicktice would be multi-orbital Havar models, okay? So in the multi-orbital Havar model will have a tie binding part and ideally we should consider five orbitals, but um, this is very difficult. So usually we would work with three orbitals and sometimes two. Uh, two is the minimum number of orbitals that can be considered. Um, this um, term is obtained from the B.S. later coster, from the geometry of the lattice and the geometry of the orbitals. And uh, the bandwidth that sets the energy scale is determined either from uh, angular resolve photomission experiments or from DFT. In addition, there, are, uh, there is the interaction. So the interaction arises from the matrix elements of the one over R Coulomb, um, Coulomb repulsion, and this was obtained many years ago by Kanamori, 
And the most important terms are the Havar um, U that suppresses W occupancy uh, in the same site, and the Hun coupling that uh, Pierce uh, um, uh, emphasized uh, just uh, in the previous talk, that uh, favors the uh, ferromagnetic alignment of the spins in the same site at different orbitals. And what I want to show you is how the uh, competition between U and J uh, impacts the phase diagram of the, of the iron-based materials. Um, so the main question is how can we study this uh, uh, relatively simple but very difficult uh, Hamiltonian? So the real way, only way to study it accurately is using Lanzos methods, but uh, we only can access uh, small clusters. Um, in addition, there is the powerful uh, density metric renormalization group approach uh, that uh, allows to go to much larger systems, but uh, it really works in 1D or quasi 1D geometries. So the question is whether we uh, can justify um, studying this Hamiltonian in these quasi 1D geometries. And the answer is yes, because uh, there are uh, families of iron-based ladders. This barium iron sulfur, for example, is a material where you can see here the ladders of, uh, of iron. And this material um, becomes superconductor with a TC of 24 Kelvin um, under 10 gigapascals of pressure. Okay, at ambient pressure, it is an insulator. It is an insulator with pi zero magnetic order in the ladder. And here you see how from insulator goes to superconductor as the pressure is increased. Um, in addition, if we replace sulfur by selenium, we get barium iron selenide. And this is a material that also becomes superconductor under pressure. But interestingly, at ambient pressure, it also has magnetic order. But rather than the pi zero kind, it develops these ferromagnetic uh, two by two blocks uh, aligned antiferromagnetically with each other. Okay, and it, this difference in magnetic order is something that I, uh, I, I will uh, try to explain in, in the remaining of the talk. Um, in addition, there are many more uh, materials with the same ladder structure and similar properties. Okay, so let's see. Uh, it, it, we should study ladders, okay? But to study ladders with two orbitals is, or with three orbitals is still very complex because there are a lot of degrees of freedom. So the question is, um, maybe we can uh, work in 1D with chains, multi-orbital chains. Uh, notice that studying two orbitals in a chain is as hard as studying single orbital in a ladder. And the idea is uh, we are going to work in chains and also in ladders, and we are going to compare the results because if we find a good agreement, that will allow us to do more work in, ladder, in chains where we can go to larger systems, okay? And it, to show you that it's not so far-fetched to uh, obtain results in chains, that they can also be applied to real systems, this uh, tallium iron selenide is a real material that has iron chains. We don't know if it is superconductor. Um, uh, experimentalists haven't studied it a lot because it's poisonous. Uh, that's what they tell me. But I think that if there are insufficient results, uh, uh, people could get motivated and try to explore this kind of material. So let's see uh, what, what I, I'm going to do today is I'm going to try to uh, tell you what happens with the magnetic order when many orbitals are active as in iron chains and ladders. And we will see is that novel orders in quantum matter will emerge. So 
first of all, a preview. Uh, this is the phase of diagram that we have observed um, as a function of the interaction U and the Hund interaction, okay? So we have found a region at low U where the system is metallic, so all the orbitals um, uh, have uh, the, uh, for, um, contribute to the Fermi surface. Then at large U, there is the mot insulator regime for all the orbitals, but we have found a region at intermediate U and relatively large uh, Hun coupling where we have the so-called orbital selective mode phase in which uh, one of the orbitals um, becomes a mode insulator and the other ones remain metallic. And this is the phase in which I'm going to focus. Uh, so um, what do we get uh, experimentally? Uh, so we know that um, in uh, barium iron selenide, the material I mentioned today with the iron ladders, um, experimentalists have observed uh, this um, um, block state, okay, with ferromagnetic blocks aligned antiferromagnetically. This was done in 2015, um, but Back in 2014, our group actually studied a three orbital model in a chain, okay? This, um, this is the dispersion of the three orbitals. We made it so that it resembles the nicktais with hole pockets at the center of the brilliant zone and electron pockets here. At Shei Hund uh, equal, uh, U, um, um, equal U over four, uh, we studied the doping of each of the three orbitals as a function of U, the filling of the three orbitals. So all the orbitals are metallic at low U, but as U increases, you see that the green orbital becomes half filled, okay? While the other two orbitals become metallic. So we think that maybe this is the situation in which we go from here to there, in which one of the orbitals become a mod insulator. We actually calculated the density of a state for this case, and we find uh, the, the gap for the green orbital and just the pseudo gap for the two orbitals that remain metallic, as you can see, with a, a 1.5 filling, more or less. In addition, we look at the magnetic properties of this state, and this is what we found. These are the spin, uh, spin correlations. And you see that the, there are um, ne nearest neighbors are ferromagnetic, but then this uh, two, size two block is aligned antiferromagnetically with the next block. Okay, so in a cartoon picture, the localized spins actually develop this kind of order. This is the one diversion of what we see here. So the question is, could it be that the block state observing barium iron selenide is actually an orbital selective mode phase? Okay, so this is a conjecture. So uh, we continue trying to explore this uh, model, uh, these multi-orbital models in, in one dimension. Okay, and so in order to simplify things, we decided to go from two orbitals, from three orbitals to two orbitals, okay? So in the orbital selective mode phase, we found that uh, the three orbitals had this feeling. So in order to go to the two orbital model, we decided that uh, we need to keep uh, one electron in the, or, uh, in the mode state, in the mode, mode orbital, and one and a half electrons in the, in, in the remaining orbital. So we go from four to 2.5, that corresponds to the parent compound. So we studied this model uh, going from a, a two uh, electrons, okay, where the effective um, spin is one. Uh, this is the, the static magnetic structure factor. So in this case, we have antiferromagnetic order, okay, with the peak at pi and this structure. Then we start adding electrons, and you see that the peak starts moving away from pi, and we start developing um, a, a patterns that are uh, ordered, but not uh, exactly antiferromagnetic. When we go to 2.5, here the peak is at pi over 2, and we develop the block structure I just described. We continue to do more to point 
2.66, and we start seeing blocks of size 3. We drop even more, and we see blocks of size uh, 4, okay, with a peak here. And eventually, we go to the point in which we have three electrons. So we have effective spin one half, and the order becomes, again, antiferromagnetic. This happens also. So this is basically the, the localized spins are the ones that form these structures. And we did the same calculation in the ladder, and we found similar results, OK? So we, we found, for example, that uh, at 2.5, uh, uh, we have the pi 0 structure in the ladder, OK, with a peak here. And then this is the Q parallel to the, to the leg of the ladder, OK? Then we go to 2.75, and we find these um, a, a blocks similar to what was observed in baryon iron selenide, OK? And here is the peak. We continue adding electrons, and we found these uh, more complex structures. So what you see is that the competition between uh, the U that uh, produces antiferromagnetism and Jay Hun that produces uh, ferromagnetism leads to these uh, uh, complex magnetic structures. Uh, okay, so, sorry. Uh, here you see that the, the lines correspond to the two orbital model, but you see this dot that corresponds to results for a condo model. Okay, the same here. The condo model is an effective model that uh, we created in order to be able to obtain even more results. Okay, we know that the charge uh, degree of freedom is frozen in the localized orbital, so we can introduce localized spins. Uh, and that leads to this effective Hamiltonian, where this term corresponds to the uh, itinerant uh, orbital. T00 is still the, the hopping in the, in the original two orbital model, uh, uh, hopping for, for the itinerant orbital. Then we have the same Coulomb U. Then this is a Heisenberg term that is a ratio between the hopping in the localized orbital and the U. And then we have this condo coupling between the localized spin and the itinerant, uh, the, the spin of the itinerant electrons, which is uh, two times the Hund coupling in the original model. Uh, so this was the uh, doping of the parent compound in the two orbital model. Um, when we go to the condo model, we see that this is the localized spin. And so the um, itinerant orbital has to have a doping of 1.5, a, a feeling of 1.5. And because of the particle hole symmetry in the condo model, this should be also a, a, a similar result to the one that we obtain for a, a feeling of 0.5 for the itinerant orbital. So in order to see that this reproduces very well the two orbital model in the orbital selective mode phase, uh, we calculated the um, A of k omega for the two orbital model. This is at low u over uh, w, where this model doesn't work, OK? So here you can see that the two orbitals are metallic. Uh, the, this is the density of states. The two orbitals contribute at, uh, at the Fermi surface. But this is the two orbital model at uh, u over w equal to 1. So now we are in the orbital selective mode phase. So you see one of the orbitals became um, uh, localized, and we have is a mode insulator with the two bands up and down, and the other orbital is metallic, and you can see here the corresponding density of states. And this is the equivalent result with the condo model. So you see that the dispersion of the itinerant um, orbital is very well reproduced. And here, okay, so this, this was for the paramagnetic case, this is the block magnetic. And here we compare the two orbital uh, model and the condo Heisenberg. This is the same as this, the density of states. You see that they are, the agreement is excellent. Okay, so we have used this model to do a lot of our calculations because obviously it's simpler. So, um, uh, we, using the generalized condo model, uh, we studied again the phase diagram. 
Okay, so this is when there is one orbit, uh, one electron in the itinerant orbital, we get a mod insulator at large u. This is when there are two electrons in the itinerant orbital, it is again a mod insulator at large u. But what happens as uh, we dope uh, and we get uh, uh, electronic feelings in between? So we see that uh, in, for, for, uh, in, in this region, more or less, so J, J is equal to U over 4 in, in the phase diagram, we start getting the blocks. And eventually, as we increase the number of electrons, we get blocks of a larger size. And in addition, we found a new uh, phase as we increase U a bit, where we found block spiral uh, states. Okay, and this is, uh, these are states that never have been seen before, okay? A regular spiral, a spiral has a pitch in between nearest, nearest neighbor spins. But what we found are uh, spirals where uh, ferromagnetic blocks of size two, for example, are, uh, are pitched against each other. And eventually as we continue adding uh, electrons, we get blocks of size three, etc. Okay, so this is a novel um, a, a spiral state that is obtained without uh, Jaloshinsky Morilla terms or without frustration. Okay, so basically there is a hidden frustration uh, that develops um, dynamically in the multi orbital um, uh, the Hubbard model. And this again comes from the competition between the U and the Hund coupling. Okay, so this again is a new phase that uh, hasn't been found experimentally yet. Uh, we really cannot tell you what material can have this property, but for example, we know where in the phase diagram we have the blocks. If you find the material like barium iron selenide that has uh, blocks, you know that uh, uh, maybe by doping it, is, it, it could be possible to achieve this region. Maybe the doping can be due via pressure. Uh, so it's, some slight changes may allow experimentalists to venture into this region. Um, so this block spiral region also has, it's interesting to see the dispersion, okay? This was the, the regular block, what I showed before, okay? This is with the two orbital model, this is with the condo. Uh, when we go to the block spiral, you see that rather than having one single quasi-particle, we get two quasi-particles, okay? And this is similar to what is obtained uh, in some models with um, a, a spin uh, orbit coupling, by the way. But here, these two um, a, a quasi-particle peaks correspond to the two possible chiralities of the spiral state. And you see that the same occurs in the generalized condom model, okay? So the, the two can be used to study this problem. So let's, uh, I don't know how, yeah, I think I, I have uh, sufficient time. Uh, so, um, um, so let's say what experiments tell us about, um, uh, about the, the properties of these uh, block phases. Okay, so again, in barium iron uh, selenide, and experimentalists using neutrons have studied the dispersion of uh, the spins, uh, the, the, uh, of, of S of Q omega, okay? And what they found is that there is an acoustic mode with a dispersion of, uh, with a bandwidth of, uh, of about 50 milli electron volts. And they found also three optical modes um, of um, a, two at about 100 uh, milli electron volts and one at 200. Uh, these uh, experiments were done in barium iron selenide where we had the blocks of size two in the ladders, okay? So using um, the MRG, uh, we studied the three orbital model. So in the phase uh, where we have this, uh, block structure, we calculated S of Q omega using the MRG. This notice that is a very difficult endeavor because for each value of omega, we had to run a whole DMRG calculation. But this is the result that we obtained. So we found an acoustic mode 
uh, you see that the, the bandwidth is uh, about 50 MeV as in the experiment. Uh, interestingly, we found that the maximum is at Q pi over two, uh, rather than at pi as it is for a regular antiferromagnet. Um, the way in which we understand this behavior is at uh, considering that this uh, comes from the long range antiferromagnetic interaction between these ferromagnetic blocks. Notice that uh, once we have the blocks, the effective lattice constant gets doubled. So that means that the effective brilliant zone becomes half. So it is reasonable to see the maximum being at pi over two. And then we have this dispersion. And uh, then we also observe an optical mode at about 100 MeV. And this has very little dispersion. And we think that uh, it is due to uh, on-site uh, excitation. So when one speed in the block is uh, flipped, uh, this, uh, there is an energy of the order of the Hund coupling, okay, and produces this mode. Um, so uh, we continue studying S of Q omega in other regions of the phase diagram, okay? So uh, now these are results with a two orbital model rather than three. Okay, so again, in the region where we have the size two blocks, we reproduce the same result that we had obtained for three orbitals. And uh, when we go to the region with uh, size three blocks, uh, we find uh, this very interesting behavior that uh, uh, it, it, it basically confirms uh, what we saw that the acoustic branch came from the long range antiferromagnetic interaction of the blocks because now the lattice size has been tripled and so the brilliant zone becomes one third and the maximum in the dispersion is here at one third of the brilliant zone. Okay, and we still have the optical uh, branch. The other thing that we tried to do was to see whether these results that we obtain in chains also occur in the ladders, okay? So this is the ladder, uh, the magnetic structure in the ladder for barium iron selenide. And these are the results that we obtain. Okay, so again, very similar to what we had obtained in the chain, which again tell us that the, for some of the calculations, we can use chains and capture the essence of what's going on in the ladders. Uh, notice that the results are for qy equal to zero. Here, because of the, of the size two, we have momentum zero and momentum pi along y. Uh, for momentum pi, the spectral weight is very, very small. Okay, so what we have found is that uh, in the orbital selective mode phase, there is an acoustic um, mode that, uh, that develops uh, and is a dispersive spin wave. Um, and it develops from the antiferromagnetic correlation among ferromagnetic uh, blocks. Here you see results for size four blocks, okay, following the trend. Uh, the spin wave bandwidth establishes a new energy scale that is strongly dependent on the size of the magnetic island. So, and you see that as the size of the island increases, the amplitude of the, of the um, dispersion goes down. And finally, we have the optical modes. Okay, you can see them in all cases. Uh, it's a dispersionless spin excitation and um, are present for all block states that we studied. And as I said, we believe that come from the spin flips. We also studied it as a function of the Hund coupling. And we noticed that as the Hund coupling increases, the position of this um, uh, mode moves up, okay, increasing with the Hund coupling. Okay, so let me uh, summarize. Uh, um, so we have, um, it, 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 from these studies, we have a message to experimentalists uh, telling them that studying materials with uh, electrons in the 3D 
4D and 5D uh, orbitals uh, with chain or ladder structures is something interesting because you can compare experimental results with theory. Uh, for the crystal grower then, uh, it is important to search for appropriate candidates uh, that may be able to realize the block states. Um, and from neutron scatterers, um, it would be important to see whether they can confirm the exotic dynamical magnetic properties that have been unveiled by this work. In particular, it would be very interesting to see whether they can find the, the uh, spiral block states. So the magnetic blocks are usually caused by demerization or frustration terms added to the Hamiltonian. But here in this work, we see that they arise uh, not from extra terms, but from uh, non-trivial electronic correlations that develop in the orbital selective mode phase. And as I said, the, the, it's due to the competition between the effects of the Coulomb repulsion U and the Hund coupling. Uh, so uh, the orbital selective mode phase and magnetic block uh, states develop uh, in Hubbard models if many orbitals are active. Okay, so that would be the take home message. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana, for, the, for this great talk. Any questions? So Chimiao has a question. Please go ahead. Chimiao, you're muted. Thanks, Joe. I think Pierce is ahead, was ahead of me. Oh, uh, Pierce, yeah. Pierce, go ahead. Uh, I don't know. Um, a beautiful talk. Thank you, Adriana. Um, I had uh, two short questions. First, um, I may have missed it, but is there an isotropy in your model, or do you really have power law spin correlations? It, yeah, well, yeah, th these are spin, yeah, th these are power loss, yeah. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, and uh, so, uh, so, okay, so um, are you able to, uh, first a technical question, uh, did you think about the alternative of using matrix product states and just time evolving them? Would that have been cheaper than your uh, DMRG calculations for each frequency? Um, well, okay, we, so those are uh, techniques that we are trying to develop now. So we are actually, uh, actually some of our new projects are to develop our, uh, other methods to measure S of Q omega. But wow. right now the, the main, the thing that we know really how to use is- the, yeah, Okay, too. Yeah. And, and last question, can, can you measure pair correlations? With your yeah. method, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll it does yeah. become superconducting. This yes, definitely work. we can, and we had done that. I, I didn't have time to talk about both things, but yes. uh, yeah, another interesting result that uh, that happens in in these models is that there is a tendency towards pairing at intermediate values of u. It's very interesting to notice that. Uh, so we have measured the binding energy uh, to mm. begin. And the measuring the, the, the binding energy, we found that the, the this binding not at large or small u, but at intermediate values. And regarding the singlet and the triplet state, which I think that would interest you, mm -hmm. uh, we have a, I think that we have been finding a singlet, but it, the, there may be regions where the triplets are competitive. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's something that also we, we need to continue exploring. Okay, thanks very much. Great. Uh, Jimmy Allen, uh, please yeah. go ahead. So thank you. Uh, so Adriana, a uh, really nice talk. Um, I, I was intrigued by the spiral uh, state, uh, both uh, about the state itself um, and also perhaps using it as a diagnostic about how to think about the underlying interactions. So, so maybe two questions. One is, um, could I uh, rationalize the um, spiral order by thinking in terms of say effective J1, J2, J3, or do I have to think in terms of kinetic, uh, sort of uh, kinetic part of the 
Hamatonia interplaying with the U and the Hunskapoli. Yeah, actually, we have tried. We, we tried to, to reproduce them with just the spins, and actually, we found that the electrons play and are, are crucial. Yeah. So it's, it's basically the, the dynamical part of the, the, of the interaction between the spin and, and the electrons that are creating, yeah. creating that. So yeah, it's, right. mm -hmm. it's basically that the tendency towards antiferromagnetism caused by the U and the tendency towards ferromagnetism caused by the Hund coupling uh, is creating some kind of actual frustration mm -hmm. that, that gives rise to all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so one, one, an, another thing that one may think about is uh, once, once we have this kind of uh, states that appear in, in, that are observed also in many of those topological systems where, where people put a, a spin orbit coupling and they have this, this kind of, uh, of, of states. And then, I don't know, by introducing, maybe there we need to introduce some extra terms to the Hamiltonian, but we, we need to explore whether some non-trivial uh, uh, topologies may also be hidden in, in a system like that that again something that we plan to do but uh, but yeah this uh this uh the, the, all these things indicate that there may be a lot of surprises in in this kind of multi-orbital apparently trivial simple or basic multi-orbital hover model mm -hmm. okay. and, and uh, thank you and along that line uh, have you uh, calculated the, the spiral pitch uh, whether that depends on the doping, the, the filling? Um, it de de depends on the doping, yeah, de de because the, the pitch is, is fixed for the size of the block, and the size of the block depends on the doping. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. Any more questions for Adriana? Okay, if no more questions, then let's thank uh, Andrena and thank uh, Piers for the excellent talks uh, today. So I think this is the end of the uh, iron based superconductor seminar series. So thank you everyone for participating. And then, thank you, thank you, Jeho. Uh, Indeed. Hopefully, yes. we'll see you uh, in person you. in the future. Thank you for the series. It was great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Hope to see you all in person sometime. Indeed. Have a good summer. Yeah. Yeah. It's about time. Yeah. <laughs>